Hey, this is C. Hope Clark once again. We're going to cover characterization from cardboard cutouts to real people. Characterization is one of my favorite, favorite parts of writing. And I think secondary characters is probably my favorite part of characterization. We often think that the story is what drives a book, but actually it's the characters. If you stop and think about all the books that you've ever loved, you think of the players, not necessarily the storyline. So we're going to cover some of that and try to make it three-dimensional for you. I want to remind you of something that I covered in plot. If you did not see plot, then let's just cover it now. Plot does not drive the characters, the character drives the plot. So just know when the story starts to take over in your book, instead of the players, then your story is going to start sagging a little bit. So remember, your characters always have to be proactive in pushing your story forward. It's also not about watching your character win. It's about watching them try not to lose. So that makes it a little more dynamic and a little more intriguing. And a reader must care about your character or the character isn't needed. And that includes a lot of your secondary characters. You don't want players in your story that don't contribute to the mission or don't contribute to the theme. If you need a player to contribute a clue or to make a scene more exciting, then give them a little bit of substance. Don't make them just jump in and jump out because you either need to flesh them out so that they carry their weight of the story and move it forward or just take them all out altogether so that you tighten the story. So just keep that in mind. No player is a lightweight. Every player has to be absolutely necessary. So how do you make a reader care about your character? You give it a little bit of depth. Let's, let's take an example. Let's take a child who hates broccoli. Okay, so parents are going to go out for the night and a babysitter comes in. The child hates broccoli. Broccoli's on the plate. Babysitter just sees that that's the dinner that has to be served. So she says, you need to eat your broccoli. The child goes, I don't want to eat my broccoli. Okay, that's, that's simple. There's not a whole lot of conflict. You, you may wonder how bad is this going to get? Is the child going to act out? Is this going to be a crazy babysitter? But let's just take it up another notch. We have the babysitter getting angry and going, you're going to eat it or you're going to sit at this table all night. The child can get scared, maybe a bad babysitter, or the child can be just totally obnoxious and go, I'm not eating it, bring it, you know, kind of, kind of thing. But then let's take it to another level. And the babysitter says, eat your broccoli that she has put on the plate and the child happens to be allergic to broccoli and they both know it. You have a story and you now care about the character. That's what I'm trying to say. You've got to give it enough depth to where you care about that character and where this is going to go involving that character. So let's just, just keep that in mind with all of your players. Uh, there has to be a little bit of a likability test. You, even your bad guys, you have to like how bad they are. So when you have a character, they need to be charismatic or smart or quirky or have habits enough that make you sympathize or empathize with them. It has to be a character that you embrace or the reader wants to embrace. If you don't feel that, then get rid of the character or spend a lot more time fleshing them out. Uh, they can just be involved in interesting situations. I have a, a secondary character in my Edisto books that's a yoga teacher. And if you don't do yoga, that's probably not going to impress you. But she happens to be bohemian in, in kind of her nature. And as a result, she winds up quirky. She can't slip up on anybody because she bangles all the time from the earrings and the rings and, the, and things like that. And every time you see her, she's got these odd clothes on. And on top of it, she's a yoga teacher, so she, she is fit as all get out. So she's very attractive. And she's just quirky and she talks about the universe and everything is about how we can't do this. I have to sage my home because you said a bad word. You know, a lot of little things like that. 
You love the character. Before it's over with, you absolutely love the character. So she can almost say anything. I use her when I need to perpetuate a situation in a mystery. I pull her in because my main player is law enforcement and she tends to be a little bit you know, straight and narrow and a little, a little more serious. So I can pull Sophie in and it just gives this, this back and forth opposite that makes for a, a 3D story. So keep that in mind when you're developing all your players is how they pair off together. You will need all types of characters. Okay, I mean all types. You've got the good guy, the bad guy, the protagonist, the antagonist. You will have love interest that may be secondary characters. You will have what I like to call sidekicks. That's what I call Sophie. Agents of information, especially when you're in mystery and suspense, your main player can't know everything about what's going on with the mystery. So they have to acquire it through other individuals. Those are agents of information. They may only have one or two points in the book, but if you're going to use them, make it count so that they're memorable, so that you remember when you get to the end of the book where she got that clue. And if you just make it a commonplace person that she got it from, you won't recall. And it lessens the story. So even your, your Lesser characters need to be three-dimensional when you use them. You'll need, uh, you may have natives, what I call natives. Those are people that have inherent knowledge of an area. My character goes to Edisto Beach. She does not know it as a native, so she tends to fall back on information from people who have lived there for decades. That's natives of inherent knowledge. Um, power figures. You'll have those that will try to flex their muscle and be in charge uh, and, and stand up to your character or be a boss to the character. And we're going to cover a little bit more about that, how that works later. And you will have those that play the victim card. You will have those that are risk takers. And then you will have some that will be total wild cards. And before you get to the end of your story, you will have to explain why you use those wild cards and why they were important to solving your story. So see, it's not just good guy and bad guy and a few sidekicks. There's a lot of depth to using, to using multiple characters. So let's go over some basic rules of choosing characters to put into your novels. They need to drive the story, not the other way around. I know I've mentioned that. We tend to think of that as the main character. That is every single character in your story. They need to push the story forward. If they don't aid the momentum, then you do not need them. Uh, they have goals regardless of how secondary they are. If you stop and think about it, when we have a conversation and we're speaking with another individual, it has a purpose. We don't just converse because we know how to speak. We converse because we want to know how that individual is doing. Did they learn new information? Uh, you, you want to know what that individual has to say or you really don't want to bother speaking with them. It's just that simple. So you, we don't just say, hello, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. You know, the sun's shining. It's great. I got a good sleep last night. You know, that's yawn material. That is so yawn. And frankly, we don't want to hear it from somebody else in real life. We want to know details. We want something that makes us feel the conversation was worth having. Same thing in your story. So you cut out all the dead wood, all the, the wording and dialogue that does not matter and doesn't perpetuate your story. Leave out the highs, how are yous, and that type of thing. So, and I'll cover that a little bit later too. At least your protagonist ought to represent your theme. In plotting, we talked about theme. There is a main theme. For instance, The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. That's a, a simple example. So you have a little theme that, you, that goes throughout your book. Whether you know it or not, there is one, and you need to keep it in mind, and that is what your protagonist has to perpetuate in her journey to do whatever she's doing in your story. That helps make them three-dimensional. Stop and think about television shows. It's, it's, it's easier to turn this visual when you think of shows like, let's go Downton Abbey. I watch mysteries, I like Blacklist. I like elementary, um, but then go Game of Thrones. There are no two characters alike. They're not even close. 
There's no way you're going to mistake one character for another in those shows. And that's what the writers did. It's, it was cast such that it was very, very simple if a character shows up in a scene, you know exactly who they are, what their mission is, and what they're doing. And that's what you want your book to do. And we tend to model our secondary characters a little bit. You may have a Steve and a Stan in a story. You know, that, that's, unless they're twins, <laughs> and you want them to sort of be muddled together, you don't want to do that because a reader reads fast, and they don't form, formulate in their head the name every time they read it. Once they establish that name, you know, Callie, Sophie, Jeb, Seabrook, those are four main characters in my Edisto books. There's no mistaking those names. And I've also made each one colorful enough that you don't mistake them for someone else. That's what you have to make sure of in your book so somebody doesn't stop and go, wait a minute, who, which one is that again? Because you happen to do three characters whose names began with S. So, so choose carefully your characters and how you depict them in your novels. So what makes a character three-dimensional other than the things I just mentioned? They are lacking something and they are seeking something. Every character. Like I said, there has to be a mission. Action moving forward. You don't want still water. You want that water moving. Uh, they have a weakness or they have a yearning for something. No character is perfect. Everybody's flawed. So every time they speak or they accomplish something in a scene, it has a purpose. They have a mission, a yearning, a desire. So keep that in mind. And then there's always going to be something that happens that triggers a moment. They may not even know they are, are, are desiring something or that they have a, a hole in their life. But a trigger can happen in your story that makes them suddenly realize they're incapable of dealing with it or they're missing something in their lives. So you can use events to trigger who a character is as well. To put it simply, it's simple, and I like little short synopses and and little formulaic things to do in a story. Simply think of it as this, a yearning for a need but doesn't have the tools to achieve it until something happens to spawn the desire to go for it. You need that for every character, every little character. Uh, I'll read you my synopsis on Murder on Edisto to show you how I have fleshed out the main character and it gives you an idea in this little short, short, short blurb it makes the character three-dimensional. Her husband, murdered by the Russian mob, Boston detective Callie Jean Morgan suffers a mental break and relinquishes her badge to relocate home to South Carolina. She hopes to reclaim her life and raise her son, but she arrives on Edisto Beach to find her neighbor murdered, her sanity challenged, and her home repeatedly violated as she fights not to get involved in crime solving when that's exactly what she has to do. You have setting, you have plot, you have characterization right there. So that helps you think three-dimensional. She lacks something, lacks direction to her life. She is yearning something. She seeks peace, a place to live, any life away from law enforcement since it did a lot of damage to her life in the past. She has a weakness that interferes with her being satisfied with her life. She failed in her previous career. She lost her husband. Her expertise is the law, yet that's exactly what she wants nothing to do with. So that gives you a little idea. And the triggers, the triggers. So what I do I then is, is murder someone she cares for, making her second guess whether or not she ought to go back into law enforcement. The result, in the end, is that she finds satisfaction in solving crime and saving lives, and she finds stability in solving those crimes, proving her worth, identifying her strengths, and owning them. That is called a character arc. And when the story opens up, she's flawed, she's had problems in her life. By the time you get to the end of the story, she's solved some of those problems, and she's learned more about herself and she's found a little bit of peace. Now, a character arc, we often think of an arc as just going like this. Okay, no, a character arc ought to start here and end up here because that character here is not the character up here. They change throughout your book. If they don't change, your book is flawed. 
So the reader wants to see how this character managed this journey in spite of all her problems and flaws and obstacles she faced and how she came out on the end. And as you know, anything you go through in life that's traumatic, you have a new feeling for life and how you do things when you come out on the other end of it. So that, that's what you're, you're wanting to think of. Uh, every character needs an arc. Of course your main concern is your protagonist and your antagonist, good guy and bad guy. But even your secondary characters need a little bit of an arc. You want them to have learned from this experience a little bit too. It doesn't mean their lives were majorly changed, but you do want them by being involved to have learned something from the experience. So you can define your character's arc by considering some of the following issues. Uh, whatever internal struggle they have outside of the main storyline. Personal change as the plot escalates. As the story grows, your character needs to change how they think and how they're going to tackle it because they fail several times in the experience. As a result of them failing, they learn new direction. So you want to show their personal change as they make this journey. You want to clearly so show their suffering. That just makes for good storytelling. Uh, as, as I mention to people often, we, we don't gossip about the good things in life. We gossip about the bad. So that's what you want to do is show the suffering so that it pulls the reader in. You want to show failure. You want to show backsliding. Sometimes they can go forward, think they're doing the great the best thing, they've got this, and then it happens to be wrong, and they backslide, and it just has ruined everything they've done. They have to start over. Sometimes they're, the good guys are not always good. Sometimes they can lose their tempers, they can make mistakes, they can get angry at things not going well, and so they show a dark side. And that's great too, that's making them three-dimensional and show someplace in there, if not multiple times, where they behave the opposite of what they should. When you as a reader read this and go, oh no, you know better than to do that. When you're talking to your character or thinking about that character going, oh, she isn't gonna do that. Okay, that's great, that's great writing. That's what you want to do. So, we've talked about a basic character art, belonging, that's a desire or a wish. They have a need of some sort. They have a wound from the past. Normally there is a wound, a flaw, something that makes them human. They also have at the beginning of a book a belief system. Now that sounds simple enough, but it may be a false sense in that belief system. It could be they've been through trauma as, as my Callie Jean Morgan went through trauma in losing her husband. There she was at the height of her career. She catches a bad guy while the family of that bad guy takes out her husband, or so she thinks. So she has been on her game for 15 years, and being on her game has cost her her husband. So that totally rocks her world, and suddenly she doesn't believe in herself as well as she did before. And on top of that, I take her job away she loses her job because she gets so fanatical about solving her husband's crime that she loses it. And she has to remove herself to an area that she hopes is crime free so she never has to think about it again. So I have altered her belief system from being solid law enforcement to she never wants to see a badge again. She has a false belief system set up from the experience she's had. She totally wants to ignore the fact that she was good at that but she tucks it away in the back of her mind, compartmentalizes it, and builds a, a little false belief system that she's operating on. Of course it doesn't function well for her, but it's what she feels comfortable in right now because she's scared to leave it. So you, your character opens with a certain belief system that you're going to change by the end of the book. Uh, they also need to be fearful of changing that belief system. They've been They've had a problem in the past. It, that's what's gotten them to the point at the beginning of the book and, and, and caused them to think like they do. So you want to have that challenged such that they're fearful of, of stepping outside the box. 
and we need to feel that from them as they're making decisions to accept this challenge and move forward in the story. And then you've also got to have triggers. There's the trigger at the beginning that suddenly rocks that belief system, but then you'll have a few more triggers in the story that makes her realize she's got to tackle this. She can't slide back into her little, you know, her little room she's boxed herself in. Uh, so you are, you're going to have triggers that keep poking at her and make her have to move forward in this story. So that that is a basic character arc, and if you you stop and think about it, in any story you've read, you will see it. You will see it, and it doesn't matter what genre it is. They sort of kind of want to move forward, but they don't because they're fearful of change. We're all like that, and that's what you want in your book because your readers will relate to it. The types of conflict for your character, I'm going to try to define a few of those for you. you you're going to have your external conflict. That's your plot. That is your basic plot. That's your storyline. That is the external conflict that they're confronting. That is the storyline that's written on the back of the book. That's what draws you in and makes you want to buy the story. That's the mystery. That's the romance. That's, you know, finding other worlds if you're sci-fi. So that's your, that's your main storyline. You'll define what is the main problem your character needs to solve in that external conflict. And you need to define at least five things that your character will be doing to solve that problem. Those are actually your major plot points in your story. It helps carry you through your story. Then there's the internal conflict. That's your character arc. So as you can see, external is a plot arc. Internal is your character arc. And they work together beautifully. Character arc is the problem your character faces on the inside. She knows she has to tackle something, but on the inside, she has a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot, lot of activity going on in her head. Some she shares with other characters, other she just keeps bottled up. But it's a personal struggle that often fights against that belief system that she's got. So you need to define what is the internal struggle or problem of your character and five ways that this problem can put your character in an impossible situation. You're looking at the flaws and the problems of this character, and you so want to take advantage of them as you're moving this story forward. Eventually, you are going to clash that external and that internal problem. They have to butt heads. They really do. That's what makes that story unpredictable. Where you think it makes common sense to tackle this problem on the external side, her internal problems are going to make her do stupid dumb things. And we all do that. We all do that. So you've had family members that did dumb things and you went, why did you do that? Well, that's the internal struggle that's going on that's making them not relate the external to the internal, internal properly. It's that simple. The story's going on all around you. So you're going to now define five ways in which the inner problem will directly oppose the external problem. You know, you're Answering these questions and listing these five things in each category is going to almost write your story. So very, very easy tools to use here. Okay. Knowing this character's arc, this character's journey internally like this is going to help you know which buttons to push. Because everything she's got wrong, that's the buttons you're going to push. So at the climax, the fear is going to come front and center with the problem that has to be solved. Of course you hope she conquers both. You do, but she cannot do it without extreme sacrifice, extreme risk, and extreme change. Uh, the reader is going to fully expect that, or it's not a strong story. Let's look at the character arc a little deeper. Just like there are, are steps in developing a plot, you have the same thing with a character arc. You're going to have an inciting event that establishes the identity that that character is living within. When you have your a plot event that starts the book off, that exciting first chapter that you want to write, by being exposed to that event, you're also going to reveal some of your character's traits and how they think about it, how they react to it. So an inciting event in the plot 
is also an inciting event for your character's development. You're going to have an act one climax. Well, there's like a failure in the quest and it gives a hint, but it also gives a hint of who the character is. So keep in mind, every time you expound on a plot, you're expounding on the character as well. There's a midpoint where the character fails at solving the problem after maybe even several failures. Thinking she's got this and it doesn't work, hopefully it makes things worse. How does that impact how she thinks about herself? It's got to make her feel like a lesser individual or, or doubt everything she's ever known about what she's good at. So you, it's a twofold thing when you develop your story, your character and your plot. Your act two climax, the fear of failure is going to try to make your character run away from it. Hopefully you've fleshed your story out to the point where running away is going to be bigger and better than her taking it on. And she knows by stepping through that portal and accepting it, she's going to have to change her belief system. She's going to have to change herself. And then the climax, the character has to dig deep, deep, deep and draw on feelings either she forgot or talents that she gave up on or talents she never thought she really, really had. Just Lord of the Rings, because most people have read that, if you think of Frodo and the ring at the end, when the world is, you know, is, is crumbling around them and he's got to let loose of that ring. And, and look at all the character development that's happened with him from the beginning when he lived at home and did nothing but look forward to a next meal in his little hobbit hole and have a good pipe. You know, that, that's how he started and now he's saving the world. And he, he has a lot of doubt in there as to whether he can do that, especially when the ring is tugging at him to not do it. So that is, a climax is not just about disposing of the ring. It's also about Frodo trying to dig down and decide who he is and can he do this and what's it going to mean for him afterwards. So uh, I, I love character arcs. I, I, I think that's as much fun or more than the actual story. So how do you start with a character arc? How do you define these characters? I suggest you interview the character. I suggest you sit down and get a, a notebook of some type and interview your character and ask them a lot of questions that you probably will not even use in the story. But what this does is make you very, very, very comfortable with the player as to how they think and how they behave and what was their upbringing so that you automatically know how they will respond in a situation just as you would a best friend or a family member. So you will, in this character analyzation or interview, and call it a Bible of sorts, because when you have a series, you're going to have to keep a Bible of all of these players. Just look at Harry Potter, look at Lord of the Rings, look at Downton Abbey, look at all of the players that involved. Somewhere you're going to find where somebody has published a Bible of sorts talking about everything, all the facts and players in that series. There's a lot of them. So not only do you just describe your appearance when you're writing about this character, but you're going to ask them what is your worst fear? What is your second worst fear? What is your milestone success that you feel proudest about? What do you? What is your favorite dinner? What is your favorite movie? Uh, if it's a guy, what kind of girl turns you off? You're asking all of these questions that you would want to know about somebody in your real life. Just reach for them. And some people will write a 50-page Bible on their main character so that when they are writing the story, they don't refer back to it. It's, they've become so intimate with that character that they can just write it. They know how that player is going to be on the page. You want to know what do they think about, let's say, children, politics, what are their hobbies, what do they do when they're not crime solving or, or traveling to other worlds or meeting new gremlins and vampires. You, you know, you think of all, even in fantasy and sci-fi, you've got these quirky people, or aliens, or however you want to call them, but they also need to be defined as if they were 
people you knew and human beings. What are their silly habits? What doors are they afraid to open? What loose ends do they have dangling in their lives they wish they could tie up? What regrets? What are their speech habits? Where were they born? Where did they go to school? Who was their childhood friend? Who was the girl that got away? You want all of these things, all the dirt and the history, and then you have it recorded. And you may not use a tenth of it, but I promise you will write that character better because you know them better. Oh, let's see. Give your good guy and your bad guy equal attention. That means in their strengths, in their noble, honorable purpose, the bad guy thinks he's the good guy. Just know that. And so everything you would ask of your protagonist, your main character, ask of your antagonist and get his feel on that. Uh, what problems would they like to solve in the world? Uh, what abilities do they have? What are the tough choices in their lives? You want to humanize this bad guy, just like you're doing the good guy. You want him totally human, because when a reader relates to a bad guy, you have such a deep story. It is so good, so that when it comes to a climax, readers feeling it. They know the two people that are going head to head. So, you know, give your antagonist some some serious concern. Um, what can drive your good guy? Uh, no, your bad guy. Let's just talk with your bad guy for a while. What can really drive your bad guy and make you feel that they are equal to your good guy? What is their need, need to accomplish a personal task? What's driving them in this story? You know, they're not just inherently bad. They just do, don't do it because, oh, that's a good, bad thing to do. <laughs> There's a reason. They have a logic. And you know, there's a reason you have profilers out there in law enforcement, is to get in the heads of these guys uh, and gals, trying to figure out why they're on this mission and what is driving them. They're not thinking, okay, we have the good people of the world and the bad people of the world. No, there's a lot of gray in between. And a lot of bad guys think they are totally validated in what they're doing because they have a logic system that they have put together. Uh, what personal desires do they have? What motivates them? Uh, what do they like to avoid? What are they fearful of? So when they're doing whatever bad thing they're going to do, what do they avoid in the process because they don't, they don't want to go there? And what is their personality like? What makes them charismatic if they are? What are their superpowers what are, you want to know what what are their strengths what makes them good because in every bad guy there's a pinch of good just like in every good guy there's a pinch of bad and you want to show it all so an antagonist now that I've covered how he could be as a human being he can also be something other than a human being he can be the weather he can be government he can be society he can be an alter ego of the main character. It can be, it can be a shark when you're coming to Jaws. Uh, it can be several things. It, it, it's the most obvious is a human being. But if you have a story where it's more about developing the main character, you've got to have a bad character of some sort. And it could be you know, what if your character gets stranded? Then what's, where's your antagonist there? If they're out on a desert island, where's the antagonist? Well, it turns into being your inner self or the weather. It can be any of several things. So you have to think along those lines, too. Where, we t we've talked about character arc. Where are arcs needed? You have a main character arc, which is seriously important in every book. And a reader needs to feel it by the time they get to the end. I've mentioned secondary characters. You need little smaller arcs for them. But you also have a bad guy arc. He's changed by the end. But if you are writing a series, which is very trendy right now, you need a series arc. You need a series arc for, that, for those same players. So that makes it very difficult when you're trying to write book one and you know that you're gonna have a three book not a trilogy, so to speak. 
uh, a three book series, your character has to have an arc in book one, book two, book three, but there has to be an overwhelming arc of the whole series. So it's a lot deeper thinking. When I, when I started my second series, my publisher said, we want a short synopsis of all three books so that we can see the character arc. Uh, quite a challenge, quite a challenge. I am so glad I put a lot of thought into it because I think it makes for richer books knowing where the book series is going with that character. And uh, the reader's going to expect that. Readers come back to series because they want to see that character change. You can't have the character same, same, same book after book after book. Sooner or later, people stop reading that book. Uh, I, I was a Janet Ivanovich fan for a long time. Don't want to totally bash the woman because she's, she's, she's been quite, quite, quite successful with um, Stephanie Plum. But after about book 17, I struggled finding the character arc any longer. At that time I was just a reader and not a not an author so I didn't realize what it was until I became more advanced in my own writing. But looking back that's exactly what happened is Stephanie Plum never changed from book to book. And readers then start saying well the books are getting old. They don't know why they're getting old but usually it's because the character arc isn't going anywhere. When you introduce your characters, we tend to do or tend to want to fall back on blocks of description. You want to try to avoid that. You want description to perpetuate the story. You want description to not stop the story. So how can you describe a character and keep the story going? You don't want to stop and go on for two or three paragraphs about their hair color, what their parents were like, where they used to live, why they have this job now, because once you read about more than three or four lines of it, you're going, okay, the story stopped. You realize momentum is gone, and you're looking for when does the story stop, start back up, and you start skimming. You, as, as Elmore Leonard said, you want to avoid the places where readers skim. And that's one of them, is trying to describe character. I had a blurb from a book I wanted to read, but it, it, it has a spoiler in it, so I'm going to try and find another one. Uh, Low Country Bride is the very first book I wrote. I like to think I have advanced from that book, but believe it or not, that is my biggest selling book, and people keep going back to that as, as, as square one and say that it is oftentimes my best book. So I want to use describing the bad guy in chapter one in that book. The broad-shouldered hog farmer grinned with a hint of the romantic, flashing white teeth and peppermint breath from candies he carried in his pocket. Here stood a comedy of errors in fashion. He usually traipsed into the office in fresh denim overalls, a John Deere cap, and a tan and black houndstooth sport coat he'd inherited from his daddy. Wearing the coat was respectful of my position, even though he towered over my average height. I reciprocated that respect. So I have described the character and what he looked like, but I've also given you a taste of his charisma and I've also introduced you a little bit to the main character as well. You're seeing he's this high, she's this high, without me saying how tall they are. And I don't even say what color their hair is. You know, I don't, I don't describe their body shape. I don't get into a lot of background. From that, I go right back into the story. That's all the description you get from him. Everything else is from his movements and his dialogue. But yet, the reader has in his head a, a, a vision of this quirky farmer. You know, there he's in overalls, and yet he's got a sport coat on, on top of it. And then a bright green John Deere cap on top of it. So it's, it's odd, you see him coming. And that's what I wanted you to see. I mentioned dialogue briefly. The, one of the best ways to identify character is through dialogue. When I hold classes on how to write a good mystery, I ask people to express what their favorite mystery is. And then I ask them why. 
Do you know, they tell me characters more so than they do the plot twist, which to me is amazing. That's, that, that means it's great writing. But when I say, what about the character struck you most? It's always 100% dialogue. Oh, I love the way he spoke. It was crisp. It was it was quirky. It was fun. Uh, you never knew how he was going to address something because we made the character real in his words. And the the more you use dialogue, the less you have to use description because the dialogue will do it for you. Now, to do dialogue well, you're using three things. You're using tags. That's he said, she said, he asked, those types of things. You want to avoid, he exclaimed, and he, you, know, you want to avoid those type of over-the-top tags about dialogue because we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear those tags. We want to hear dialogue. So if you want to show anger or exclamation or anything in dialogue, do it in the dialogue. Don't do it with the tag, if that makes sense. If you can stay with he said and he asked, try to do it. Try to stick with those two. And I will then tell you, try to do without tags altogether. Because if you can write dialogue and the reader follow you without saying, Tom said, Sally said, then you've written some fine dialogue. If the reader can follow it, it without looking at who said it, it's great. You've read books, we've all read books, where dialogue goes down and it's they're talking back and forth, back and forth, and there might be six, seven lines of dialogue. And because it's not clearly defined to that character, you have to count back up to the last tag to know where Tom started because every other time is Tom. You know, that, that pulled you totally out of the book where you're trying to define, okay, who said that? And you have to count back up. That's, that's bad dialogue. So. You want to try and write dialogue such that if you if your tags fell off, that the reader would still keep going and know exactly who's speaking. Beats. A lot of people don't know what beats are. Uh, some have called them action tags. What they are is action by the, uh, the character without saying he said. So you can say, Tom walked in the room and then have him start talking. You don't have to say, Tom said, because Tom just walked in the room. You knew the following dialogue was Tom speaking. The best stories tend to use more beats and less tags, because beats are momentum. Beats are keeping the story going forward. At the same time, they're pulling double duty by telling you who's speaking. So beats are awesome. When I write and I have to do a said or ask in a story, it, it draws me up short because I've taught this so many times, and I will at that time try to reword to see if there's some way I can leave it out. Internal monologue. That's thoughts by your point of view character. So whatever chapter, whatever point of view you are covering, you may have the same point of view through the whole book, you may have two or three. You may have the good guy in one chapter, the bad guy in another chapter. Internal monologue is a thought process. And sometimes you can say, oh my gosh, here she comes again. Oh, hey, how are you? What you've done is say that character is speaking by using the thoughts in her head. So that's internal monologue. So your tools, your three main tools for dialogue are tags, beats, and internal monologue. I call that I am. So let's go into, let's see. Dialogue should be unique enough to define each character. We've covered a little bit about that, and a little goes a long way. Avoid excessive dialect and avoid what I call speechifying. Excessive dialect is when you have somebody that has an accent or a lisp or speaks a foreign language and is trying to speak broken English. You do not want to do it verbatim as they would say in real life. It's very, very tiring reading to try and read something for it. So what you want to do is give pieces of it, just mild pieces of it. In Tidewater Murder, I had Haitians and people who spoke Gullah because it was set on St. Helena Island in South Carolina. I had to use it 
sparingly, just teeny, teeny pieces of it. Yet you understand that character is Gala or is Haitian without having to learn another language. So be careful with that and speechifying. I, even if somebody is giving a speech, you do not want to just list the speech. Nothing is static, absolutely nothing is static. When I'm speaking right now, I'm the only one speaking, you're the captive audience. It's not just my words that's going down on the page. My hands are moving, I'm looking different, different ways, I'm checking out my notes on my paper, I'll adjust my glasses. There's no telling what I will do while I'm trying to present. Those are beats. Those are all beats. So when you're trying to show a character who is speaking and you start seeing it getting longer than three sentences, it's time to break it up. Even if they're the only person speaking in the chapter, you want to break it up with beats, reactions, to show that that person is there. You're trying to keep it three-dimensional. When you just do dialogue, you're pulling them out of the story and you're making it two-dimensional. So keep them in the moment with the temperature or when somebody is speaking, what's in their head? They're thinking, oh my goodness, I just said the wrong thing or oh my gosh, did I just scratch my nose for the fourth time? They're thinking as they're speaking. You want all that in there. You want all that in there. I'm going to read a short piece from Echoes of Edisto, which is my brand new release that's just come out. And I, it's very, very brief, very simple, but it clearly shows you the beats, the tags, and the internal monologue. And I want to give you a second and see if you can, you can hear it. Callie. Beverly caught her daughter in the hallway before Callie exited and reached the chief. They're leaving a mess on my doors, she complained, pointing at the fingerprint technician. Yes, let's worry about smudges and ignore the crime. No other option, Mother. They'll take your prints as well to rule them out of the ones they find. Just do as they ask. And can you bring me about three aspirin? Beverly held up her hands, flipping them over to analyze her nails. Jesus, Mother, they aren't here to inspect your manicure. Beverly snatched her fingers closed. I know that. Okay, just a very short piece there. There's only one tag in that entire paragraph, yet you, in that entire section, yet you did not realize it. There's no he said, she said anywhere. So what I did is one place. They're leaving a mess on my doors, she complained, pointing at the fingerprint technician. That was the only beat in that, I mean, only tag in that entire setting. And yet you didn't miss it, didn't miss those tags at all. And you knew exactly who spoke. I doubled that up with a beat as well, pointing at the fingerprint technician. So you're seeing things moving and action through that dialogue. Um, there was one internal monologue there. This is obviously in Callie's perspective. So she's talking to her mother. Her mother's talking about the crime technician messing up her house. Her mother happens to be quite, a, quite the socialite, so it, it makes for a little com uh, comedy scene. But when Callie goes, yes, let's worry about smudges and ignore the crime, that's internal monologue. And it adds depth to the story and it breaks up dialogue. Everything else is being done by beats. Beverly caught her daughter in the hallway. Callie, well, you know who's saying it. Um, Beverly held up her hands, flipping them over to analyze her nails. You know she's gonna speak next. Uh, Beverly snatched her fingers closed. I know that. You can see it and hear it at the same time. So you're keeping it three-dimensional without just falling back on just the dialogue. So that, I'm going to take it back down to one final thing that I think is going to do wonders in making your characters three-dimensional. I will try to keep it brief. But I want to draw attention to something that you probably never realize that you can use with your characters that will just open your world. And that is knowing diversity. Knowing diversity when you're speaking. And that, I'm not talking about racial, I'm not talking about ethnicity. When you are going throughout your, your day, you will meet people that are in a higher position than you, or people you're in charge of, 
are people that look up to you. In other words, there are different degrees of reaction between the players. Status is what it's called. And it is impacted by three things, and that is your relationship to a person, your position relative to that person, and the situation involved. So think of the roles that you play and how you behave differently when you act as a, with, act, react to your boss, your lover, your child, your mother, a waitress, a telemarketer. telemarketer. You're different people with every one of those people. So we're not just one dimensional. So let me give you an example. Let's do good cop, bad cop scene that you see in all the detective shows and you have a good cop, you have the bad cop, and then you have the guy that's got his you know, wrist handcuffed to the desk who is the, the perp, the target, the guy that was arrested. You have three personalities going on there. You have the bad cop. He's the animated one. And they really do this, y'all. <laughs> um, he's the bad one. He is called the parent figure. Then you've got the good cop. He's the adult figure. He's the one trying to keep everybody on even keel. That's what a good adult does. The bad guy is the child figure. He's subservient to the other activity going on in the room, to the other two players. So you have the parent figure, the adult figure, and the child figure. And you see how, you know how they're gonna react with each other. Now, let's turn it around. Let's say they have to let the bad guy go because they don't have enough evidence. So the bad guy goes back on the street, goes back to his gang, and struts in. Guess what? He just turned into a parent figure. So he was a child figure, he became a parent figure. He went from being subservient to big, bad, and in charge. He is going to react differently in the two settings. Now let's go back to the cops. Let's just say the bad cop is really not that bad of a person. And he goes back, he goes, well, crap, and we're gonna have to go back on the street and interview a few more people. He's turned back into the adult. And you may have the good cop go off on a tangent going, we had this guy. I don't know why we, we let him go. I, I disagree with what the, the attorney said. You've seen all those things on TV. Okay, he was the good cop in the room. He turns into a child when he didn't get his way. So in all of your characters, when you're defining them, you've got your Bible, you've got your situation, you're writing your character, and yet he's going to react differently depending on whether he's an apparent adult or child situation. So keep that in mind. You can have somebody who is trying to be an adult in all situations and you take away their comfort zone and they become an absolute child. So keep in mind, characters are not static. They're always moving, they're growing, they're changing, they're evolving, they're eroding, they're confrontational, but they are always pushing the plot. So when you think about characters, think about arcs, Think about status and the situation they're in. Think about dialogue. You pull all of these together and you're going to slam it home with your story. Even a mediocre, mediocre story can be awesome when your characters jump off the page. So just keep that in mind. Thank you very much.